Good afternoon and welcome to the first in a series of Iconic Office webinars where today we're going to be navigating the COVID-19 landscape and particularly looking at restructuring, returning and reimagining Dublin's working world. So I'm delighted to be joined today by commercial real estate and flexible workspace industry experts, Jerry Corcoran of BNP Paribas Real Estate, Joe McGinley of Iconic Offices and Michael Healy, Savills, Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us today. So one of the things we really want to discuss today, it's been a very changeable few months, worrying for employers and their employees. And over the past maybe two months, we've really been navigating getting back to the workplace. One of the most important things for any employer to think about right now is a people first approach to developing a return to office plan. So Jerry, your team with uh, BNP Paribas Real Estate have been helping employers with this. How important is having a return to workplace scheme um, plan available? I think it's fundamentally important, Carol. Um, I suppose at the outset, when, when, when um, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, commenced, I suppose, there was a, a myriad of gu guidance and documentation out there from various departments within the government uh, bodies and, and beyond. And I suppose most employers who started to look at that point were... Uh, I suppose, confused with the level of uh, guidance that was out there. And so far as it was unclear to them what precisely they needed to do, what mm -hmm. steps they had to take. Obviously, we were all quite familiar with, I suppose, what you call the holy trinity of, of the, the physical distancing, good hand hygiene and um, uh, cough etiquette and so on. Um, it probably was the document that was produced by government on the 8th of May, which was the protocol document for the safe return to work that probably provided the most clarity for employers uh, as to what it is they needed to do. Um, and that uh, identified, I suppose, a roadmap in terms of what management structures had to be put in place in terms of uh, creating a management uh, response team within the, the workplace uh, and then preparing a plan uh, and sharing that with the employees and get, so they got an understanding of what it was that needed to be done. And of course, then there was the implementation of those controls within the workplace, which are typically, I suppose, passive controls, uh, hand hygiene, uh, dispenser units, uh, screens where, where they were necessary, uh, uh, route markings throughout the office space to provide clarity in terms of the movement through the office. And then the practical um, sort of organization of desking spaces so that you seated uh, colleagues as, as far away from each other as possible. Um, on the return, but being mindful of, I suppose, again, the, the, the primary uh, directive for government was to continue to work from home for as long as possible. Um, and thereafter, obviously, the, the implement the plan to, to help to get people yeah. back. And working from home where possible is still is still the guidance. But Jerry, do you think that the government protocol document, do you think that was issued in a timely enough fashion for employers? I think it was. I think I think it was. I think because a lot of a lot of employers and a lot of uh, I suppose professionals like myself would have been looking at it in advance of that and looking at best practice internationally, uh, particularly to see what uh, countries like China and Korea had done um, as they were so far ahead of us in terms of uh, of introducing controls. So I, I think the protocol document was very helpful because it helped to to, to distill and condense the critical items. I suppose that employers had to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yes, in, 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 in hindsight, it probably was timely because, again, it would have been difficult to rush a document like that in, into, the, into, the, in, into the, the, the public arena because, you know, it was still evolving. Um, yeah. And it is to, to this day, of course. But. And actually, that's a really important part of any plan that we discuss or any of the measures we discuss today. It's the reality that the environment is changing on certainly a weekly, if not a daily basis, and that any plan put in place has to be responsive to that. Um, Michael, within Savills, you've had the experience that um, you have international colleagues that you can draw from their experience, um, not just during the lockdown, but actually in, in preparing to come back to the office. So for, for the Dublin office, how has your experience been? You're right about Savills. I've been in international business and we have a big presence in China. And uh, so we learned quite a lot uh, early on about going back to the office uh, from our from our colleagues over there. Um, but in terms of what we've done, we've gone back in, in two phases. Um, initially, you know, a small portion, it was something like 10% went back. 
And then more recently, we're, we're up to about 40%. And uh, what we've tried to do is bring our sales teams back as much as possible um, and continue to um, facilitate our colleagues who are on the non-transactional side of the business to, to work from home. And for us, that's all been about trying to create a bit of a, a buzz within the sales teams. Obviously, we're, we're focused on doing property transactions. So, um, you know, by bouncing off each other in a socially distance way, um, you know, that, that has proved to be fruitful. Yeah, and look, a buzz around sales team. I, I think that that's one of the core differences we're seeing maybe between the public and the private sector right now, that there is this imperative to get back, not just to the workplace, but get back to business as yes. safely as possible. So in terms of demand, are you seeing, I, you know, we want to see that critical roles are brought back to office places first. And for businesses, for commercial businesses, a sales role is a critical role. So are you seeing demand tally with that? Yeah, well, well I mean, this year, uh, you know, transaction volumes, well, certainly in, in Q2 this year, trans transaction volumes were, were down. Um, uh, just because of what was happening, you know, the, the COVID, I think every business sector was, was affected by it. Um, but I, we are seeing increased demand um, uh, or more sustained demand. Uh, so even this week, I was out on a number of itineraries with uh, occupiers looking for office space, in the, particularly in the city centre, um, mix of uh, expansions and uh, also a new entrant into, into the market as a result of uh, Brexit. So Brexit isn't gone away. Would you that's, believe? That's, and, yeah, that's and, such a pertinent point to bring up now because while we're so focused on the pandemic and pandemic responsive solutions, we need as businesses to be mindful that Brexit is on the horizon also. Um, so the new entrant into the Irish market, um, they're coming as a result of Brexit, as you identify. Had they a plan in place prior to the pandemic? Yeah, they, they had. And um, I suppose they, they, their intention is to set up a base here, um, well, ideally before year end. And uh, if anything, the um, pandemic just put that um, move on ice because of, you know, of, of the lockdown. But it, very much it's, it's all systems go. Um, I mean, obviously, when they, when they take the office uh, and depending on what stage we are in in, the, in the, the lockdown, they'll have to adhere to social distancing. So they might mm -hmm. not be able to occupy the office in its, its, in its entirety. Um, but, yeah, I, I think businesses are, are still planning to, to move forward. And, um, you know, if, there will eventually be a vaccine and hopefully everything will, will go back to normal at that stage. Mm -hmm. And look, that, that's, that's, again, one of the things we want to talk about today, because we know the importance of keeping business going. Um, Joe, we're actually we're actually having this webinar in one of Iconic Office's stunning buildings, the Masonry. And one of the things that I found really remarkable upon entering the building, so you have the tech solution for uh, checking um, my temperature coming in, which Correct. is great. Yes. The signage has been so stylishly done, and I would expect nothing less from Iconic Offices, as you can see from the surrounding. It's it's beautiful, but I think what's really interesting about your signage, more so than signage that I've seen in other places and, and office spaces is that it doesn't look temporary. It looks quite permanent. Yeah, and I suppose that, that's our kind of expectation. I think nothing tells us that this is going to be a short-term thing. So when we're looking at things like, you know, investing in equipment or potentially a tech solution mm -hmm. uh, or signage, we're looking at it um, as that it could be permanent. I don't think anybody knows how long it's going to go on for. Okay, and um, we're here really to talk about um, response action plans to get people back into the workplace and to to regain momentum in, in the, the workplace and in the marketplace. So how many buildings have Iconic Offices got now? Uh, so we've got 16 buildings all in Dublin City. Okay, so in terms of an action plan for you, was that one action plan or was that 16 action plans? <laughs> Um, one action plan uh, delivered across 16 different buildings in, okay. in a very, very similar way. Right. And talk us through the point. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I found interesting was earlier this month, um, a survey, uh, Robert, um, Robert Walters survey sure, yeah. issued, and it showed that 29% of employers haven't got a plan in place for a phase yeah. recovery or for a phase return to the workplace. So um, really there are a lot of the people that we're speaking to today. You know, we want to show what does an action plan to return to the workplace look like? 
Um, well, for us, um, we I suppose we moved quite quickly to put our plan together and we put together a kind of a draft 15 point plan, um, which we then, um, that blueprint was installed in one building, which is the Lennox building on South Richmond Street as a kind of a trial just to make sure that everything uh, worked well. Um, I think the, the main thing that people talked about, and you touched on it, was uh, the thermal um, camera uh, scanners that we've installed. So mm. literally when you walk into any of our locations, um, there's a, a unit in front of you with a TV screen and a camera above it. As you walk towards it, you see yourself and your temperature literally ap- appears above your head on the screen. And it's red if, uh, if you're okay, or sorry, it's green if you're okay, and then red if you actually have a temperature. Uh, so the theory behind that is that if we can prevent anyone in the building have a, a temperature, we're much more likely to be able to pre- prevent um, infections. Okay, and, and that makes sense. So that's a really important point of, of the 15-point plan. You know, what are some of the other things? Because I'd noticed that you have hand sanitizing um, stations almost in every room that, that yeah. I've come through. You know, what are some of the other key points when, you know, because you're a flexible work, uh, workplace provider, you have people coming in from different organizations. So yeah, exactly. have you had to change um, how people navigate the buildings? Uh, have you had implemented one-way systems? Yeah, so I think it's the, the tech piece people are most interested by. But then, yeah. yeah, we have other solutions. So we install disinfectant mats at the entrance uh, to all locations. Um, um, we did lots of other things, uh, including the increased hand san- sanitization, which you talked about. We increased the airflow in um, all of the buildings where possible. Um, and uh, I, won't, I won't present the whole 15 point plan to you right now, um, but we put in as many um, different ideas as we could to, I suppose, make people feel more comfortable coming back into the workplace. Yeah. Uh, um, and look, we can see that in action. And it, it's important to have these measures in place to halt the, the spread of the virus. But there's a huge psychological element here as well. People want to know they're protected. So, you know, there, there's a big there's a big ethos in compliance. You know, it, it's important to know you're compliant, but you also have to show you're compliant. And, you know, that's where we'll, we will improve confidence of people coming, returning into the workplace. And um, so, Jerry, you might just talk to us maybe about mm. um, the very practical roadmap that you recommend. So when you're sitting down as a consultant, when you're sitting down with employers who are just starting this journey to get their employees, their employees back into the workplace, you know, what kind of practical roadmap can you put in place for them? I think one of the first points is the one you just touched on, which is the importance of early engagement with the employees so that they're part of the plan. They, they understand the plan as it's being developed. Mm-hmm. So because ultimately it's, a, it's about the employees, it's about the safe environment for them to return to. Uh, and it's critically important that, that they fully understand all the measures that are being put in place. And of course, and, to, and maybe it's restating the point, but it's no harm to restate it, that it's being done for their benefit to protect them and to ensure their safety. Um, in terms of how the plan would, I suppose, kick off initially, it's a matter, I suppose, it's a matter of discussing with the employer what it is they want to do. Like how many people do they want to get back? Is it a, is it a, a rotational uh, process in terms of uh, teams? Or is it just a matter of they want to get particular teams such as what Michael was talking about, about sales, but perhaps like client facing members of, of the workforce who need to probably be in a more collaborative environment to bounce ideas off each other and, and, and to, you know, to create that kind of collective energy to get work done. Whereas other teams perhaps uh, would maybe who wouldn't have a client facing uh, responsibility could perhaps continue to work from home or work from a different uh, location. So it really is in the first instance trying to um, establish what it is the client wants to do do you give recommendations about that? We do, we do. In particular, I suppose what we do is we'll walk, we'll walk the, the office space and mm. we will sort of um, engage with them in terms of what they want to do and then give them advice as to what we, what we think would be the best solution in terms of how, how to get uh, mm-hmm. numbers of people back in. But it's initially, it, it's a survey, it's, it's walking the floor, it's analysing the, the client brief, I suppose, and then it's coming up with a, with a, with a number of, of ideas and solutions. Um, and again, we would we would engage with our clients across Europe, particularly in our office in Paris, where again they've done substantial work uh, within the group and beyond. So we we would we get a lot of information from them and guidance from them as well um, on, on I suppose on best practice. Um, and then there's the matter of, of the budget, which is a critical point again as to how much uh, employers mm-hmm. are, are uh, 
what they might consider to be a reasonable outlay in terms of getting this work done. Because again, I suppose at the outset, and we're looking at it, uh, it's human nature. We're all looking at this as perhaps a temporary measure. And, you know, we all want value for money. We all want to do the right thing. But at the same time, you know, it's not a, a, a blank check in that respect. Um, but of course, as time has moved on, and as Joe quite rightly pointed out, I think we're perhaps looking at a more of a long-term um, relationship with, with these restrictions um, as to what that is. Ultimately, we don't know, but I think it is quite likely that a lot of the measures Joe has put in place here are probably the right measures, because I think it, it will be that social distancing, physical distancing in whatever uh, dimension that might be. It's currently two metres. It may reduce so in, in time. It may not. We don't know. But I think the, the issue certainly of the hand hygiene and all that etiquette in respect of the transfer of, of droplets and so on uh, has to be very carefully uh, managed and will probably continue to do so into the future. Yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to know, are you seeing um, people making major changes to the space, I, like cellularizing offices to that degree, or is it more the easier solutions around acrylic screens, hand sanitization it, it stations? It tends to be the more... Simplistic. Well, the, the limited intervention at the okay. moment, certainly. Yeah. 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 That's quite telling in itself, then, because that means people are seeing this as very much um, temporary measures, whereas, Joe, through iconic offices, you've really embraced things as being not necessarily permanent, but of a more long term nature. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair to say. But at the same time, we haven't got, we have invested in technology and we've spent a lot of money investing, I suppose, on behalf of our members. <sighs> But we haven't gone to the stage yet of rebuilding space um, uh, in that more fundamental way. And that's why I was just cur curious to mm. see if that was something that uh, Jerry was seeing. But I think right now, everyone's mm. just trying to understand it. It's yeah. like the, the data gathering phase before people make the more structural yeah. uh, changes. Yeah. And I think that's a valid point. I think as we go forward, I think in terms of the, the blueprint on the drawing board, in terms of design of, of, of future office fit-outs, I think you will see changes. I think changes are likely in terms of how the, the office uh, footprint appears, the, the, the large open plan uh, dense um, uh, arrangement may not uh, be the same into the future. I think we may see changes. We may see more cellularization. Okay. Michael, I might bring you in on that point yeah. because I'm sure your team are not just um, responding to client inquiries of, of this nature, but you, you're probably guiding them as in, are you advising on these changes and are the changes more structural? Yeah, so um, well, Savills uh, undertook a survey uh, quite recently back in May. Um, uh, so we uh, sent out a questionnaire to over a thousand of our occupier clients, um, asked them questions about you know, how they um, are using the office um, what their experience of lockdown is or was, and um, the future, their future ideas of, of, of the, the office environment. And um, I suppose the, the kind of what came out of that was that we're seeing that there, there won't be a, a fundamental change in the, in the amount of office space that corporates will require, but they will certainly be using their offices differently um, and to, to incorporate more remote and agile working but also then the physical office space itself um, needs to cater for more you know, collaborative and creative and, and, and social spaces. So um, yeah, the, the office um, as it's currently set up, um, you know, where it thrives and what we found from the survey, it thrives from um, group activities. Um, so you know, that collaboration piece, that, uh, that creative element, um, you know, getting that buzz around the sales teams and what yeah. have you. Um, but remote people being forced to remote work, uh, and I found this myself, um, it, it, do, it does, it is suited to more solo activities. You know, say if you're doing a, reading a document or preparing a pitch or preparing a report, it's, it's, it's great to be able to head off into your, your home office or your dining room table, whatever the case may be, and, and, and do that element of it and not be inter interrupted by your, by your colleagues. So I think going forward, um, you know, office design, I think needs to change to cater for both those solo activities um, and yeah. you know large meetings and, and collaborative spaces. Does it feel like maybe the pandemic is accelerating trends that might have been at play, um, but perhaps kind of in the background or maybe not a priority? Like for example, remote working. Yeah. You know, it was one thing when remote working was 
and using technology for virtual meetings. There was a, an, an element of novelty. And then all of a sudden it became necessity. You know, I, I've heard it or I've read about it being described as um, the, the largest uh, beta test in history yeah. for the workplace. And I, I think there's an element of truth in that. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing now is that, you know, people who wanted, who thought they wanted remote work, maybe remote work is not quite what they pictured it to be. Um, but the most recent stats are showing that the majority of Irish employees, um, I think there was 93% of a, of a 2,200 person survey, and 93% of Irish employee survey said they do want the opportunity to remote work uh, more often. But interestingly, only 11% wanted it full time. Yeah. And I wonder if before the pandemic, if we'd had a similar survey, would those figures have been the same? Yeah, we, we've done similar surveys. So last year, we did a, another survey called What Workers Want. And that threw up that generally employee, employees wanted to work, say, one or two days a month from home. Uh, whereas in the middle, when we did it again in the middle of the pandemic, that had increased um, you know, to two or three days a week. So we're going to do the survey again, you know, maybe in October um, to see if, there, if there's been any, any change. Um, but I think that, yeah, as you say, the, the, the was, there was a lot of talk about remote working before mm -hmm. the pandemic. And um, I think what the pandemic is or the lockdown has shown is that many companies are, well, all companies now are set up to, to do that. Um, but as well, I think it also has highlighted the deeper we go into uh, lockdown, the need for an office. Uh, to, a need for that place for teams to, to get together and, and, and uh, move on. And I mean, I find as a, as a manager, it's particularly, you know, hard and difficult to, to manage a team remotely. And, um, and, and I would hate to start, a, you know, as, as a graduate or whatever in the industry now in the middle of a, of a lockdown when you're not surrounded by your, your employees or your, your, your colleagues and your, your mentors. So um, I think, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the lockdown has really kind of shone a light on how we use the offices and the yeah. need for it. I, you know, and I think in the, in the spirit of it, acceleration trends that were already in place, I think it's really tested some of the technology solutions we put in place. And some of them have really excelled and some of them have not. And that's the reality. So when you talk about uh, the challenges in managing your team remotely, you're certainly not alone um, because the, the survey I referred to earlier showed that 75% of employers felt their senior management team weren't equipped um, not, not, tech, not from a technology point of view, but maybe from a training point of view to manage their team remotely. And um, so it does, of course, influence people coming in on entry level jobs if their first experience in the workplace is being managed remotely. We just don't know how to even navigate mm. that. Um, so, Joe, is that something in terms of the change in culture? There are so many there are so many aspects to the restructuring and when it comes to reimagining the workplace and managing remote teams is one of those. Yes. You obviously were in a position that you as a business leader had to manage your team remotely. How, how was that experience for you? Uh, I thought it was challenging. Uh, it was definitely more challenging than being in the workplace. Um, we, we started to take our staff back, um, I suppose, reasonably early. And we were quite lucky in that, obviously, we're in the, the workspace business, so we had plenty of space and we could ensure the two metre distancing by putting people, people over a greater area. So we did manage to get people back to the workplace earlier. But I think for most people, if they're being honest, uh, managing people remotely, especially from kind of like a HR perspective, is really challenging, I think. And most people just don't have the answers. I wonder if when we're talking about, you know, the action plans to get the workplaces ready, is there something we ought to be doing to get employees ready to return? I'm going to throw it out to, to all of you. Have you, in your experience over the past few months, how have, how receptive have employees been? Well, everyone, everyone has their own opinion. And I mean, you can't force someone to come back to the office. Um, you know, some people are genuinely scared about, you know, using public transport, as the case may be. So I, mean, I think Jerry's touching it. I think the first step is to, to do a survey amongst yeah. the staff to see what their opinions are and then try and incorporate that into, into the plan yeah. about coming back. Staff to the questionnaires, yeah. very important. A, a, quite a broad range of, of questions. And then the opportunity for staff to input their own questions. And okay. answers. Did your organization uh, do that for your did. team? Yes. yes and did, what yeah. kind of insights came um, from that? It, 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 it was mixed. It was, it was predominantly positive. Um, mm -hmm. I think 
most people watched the initial phase of, of working from home was perhaps seen as a little bit of a uh, of a novelty. I think it, it soon started to wear off for certain people because of the challenges of trying to trying to work exclusively from home. Um, I suppose largely to do with you know if you've young children and so on, or you've got other other factors that you need to try and work in during your day. That ordinarily, if you were in the workplace, you could be going somewhere else thereafter, doing something else. Uh, whether it's another activity or whatever it might be. Um, I think there was definitely um, uh, a sense that initially it was kind of exciting and so oh, this is great, we can, you know, mm-hmm. we're all up, up to speed technologically. We've got all our uh, network access and uh, this is great, we can do it. But I think uh, there's also a sense that for certain people in certain teams, there is a need to collaborate and there probably is a need to have a certain amount of face-to-face time, even if it's just kind of review meetings uh, or, or kind of update meetings or just project planning that that's better or best done uh, face-to-face obviously we have zoom and webex and uh, teams and we're all experts now and all of that um, but initially that was probably a bit of a challenge as well because i suppose again if you look at certain sectors are more geared up towards uh, remote working and have been for the last decade mm-hmm. or so but for many um, uh, i suppose many companies in, in various different sectors that wasn't the norm. So there was, there was a steep learning curve as well. So not only were you um, uh, required to work from home, but you had to kind of learn how to work from home in some respects. Yeah. So that, that's, that has been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. I, I think, think it's, oh, sorry. I, I, I was just, just, just going to say, I think uh, yeah. we need to remember that like people were at home at, for probably the longest period they ever were at home yeah. uh, or were off work in their whole pr- professional career. So there's a lot of people who are just anxious to come back to work again, just the unknown. Um, one thing that we did was we set up a COVID response team. So that's kind of people from different departments within the business, some who we felt would be really good at innovation and other people that we felt would be a bit anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's actually worked out really well. So any, anytime anyone has an idea, it goes into the COVID response team, they kind of trash it out. They're the ones who have the most amount of knowledge and then hopefully a solution comes out the other side. But we also used uh, that team to present uh, um, kind of online training before people came back to the workplace to staff um, to show them what the workplace looked like, what was expected of them, what was expected from the business. And that worked out really well um, to the point where we actually then introduced it across all of the buildings as well to show other company staff what they could expect when they were coming to come back into the workplace. I think that decreased the level of anxiety people could actually see in advance what was happening in the workplace and what changes they were going to be met with. That's a very useful tool. I, and I know in, in the construction industry, the, the CIF actually did something quite similar where people had to undergo um, two hours of training in advance to come back to site again, just to know the, the, what the experience would look like, even if it's a case of uh, not all coming in at the same time, not all coming in through the same door, following a flow of path, you know, making all offices like the interior of IKEA, uh, essentially, but following... Yeah. Yeah. following a path and i'm just looking obviously this webinar is going out live so we have some questions coming in um and i'm just going to throw them out to the group there and one of the questions that has come in is do you think that um the office space per employee will actually increase and embrace a more uh, google or facebook style even now I, I i'm not sure who that question is for so michael i'm going to throw it over okay. to you first so do you think that office space per employee will actually increase? Well, yeah, so at the moment, um, well, before the, the, the lockdown, um, the typical ratio was one person for every 10 square meters. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, you know, to accommodate for, for social distancing, it's gone up to one for every 20 square meters. Um, but every organization is different. So I think when the, when the pandemic is gone and hopefully there's a, there's a, there's a vaccine, I mean, my own opinion is that um, it'll it'll go back to the the one is to ten square meters, um, but I think the way in which we, as I said, the way we which we use the office is going to be different. So there's going to be more agile working. Um, you know, um, the the days of the vast array of open plan offices on their own, I think, are well, it'll, it'll still be there, but it'll need to be complemented by having more. Uh, space for um, you know thinking and and solo activities. So maybe you know libraries or more booths for um, Zoom calls and team calls, um, both individual and then obviously you need bigger conference facilities to be able to connect with um, 
both your clients who are um, off-site and also your colleagues who might be continuing to, to work remotely. So all that has an impact on the amount of space that uh, corporates will need. Um, I think certainly in the short term, corporates are going to be, um, you know, uh, not be splashing out the cash and refitting all their, their offices um, um, because of, you know, the, the global downturn. But I think in time um, they will and the office will, you know, it's, it's going to have to be uh, an enticing place um, to get employees to, to, to work from. And, um, you know, the war for talent is going to mean that um, offices, employers are going to have to provide really good uh, flexible uh, workplaces to be able to attract the right talent. Yeah, and I, I think that that your opinion is weighted more coming from Savills, who's seen obviously as such a, a leader in the office space here in Ireland. So I, I have to ask then, are there concerns within, within Savills Dublin, you know, about the impact of the pandemic and what it's going to do to the office market in Dublin over the the next kind of 12 to 24 months? Yeah, well, in, in the short term, um, you know, transaction volumes are down and that's, you know, a big concern. But I think, you know, looking into the future, I mean, we published a report there in conjunction with um, Dublin City Council called, uh, why, or D Dublin Chamber, should I say, um, called, you know, Why Dublin? Um, looking at all the reasons why all these multinationals are, are coming to, to, to Dublin in particular. And, um, you know, when the last downturn happened, um, you know, the, the office market was really driven by, you know, indigenous demand, whether that be from governments or big law firms or whatever the case may be. Whereas now, uh, I mean, Dublin is full of, you know, tech companies, uh, financial services companies, aviation leasing, pharma companies, um, all international, uh, and they all have office requirements. And albeit, you know, some of their employees might be working remotely more, they still have a requirement for office space. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, into the future, I'd be quite positive about the, the office market in Dublin. I think it's, uh, Dublin is a global tech city. Um, nearly, I think most of the tech companies in the world are based here. Um, so look, I think the outlook is positive for offices. Okay, and obviously we're here today to discuss offices and I don't want to take us off topic to any great extent. However, you know, we need to acknowledge that um, there is office space being delivered for hundreds of thousands of employees within the capital and there are living spaces for tens of thousands of employees. Well, How do we marry that? Well, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of residential under construction at the moment. So if you go down the Docklands, for instance, and you see all these office blocks going up, you look behind them and you can see a residential block going mm -hmm. up as well. So the PRS or private rental sector uh, is, is, is booming in Dublin. So there's a lot, there's a lot of you know, that stock coming on. Uh, and there is more stock coming available in, in, in the suburbs. Um, also, I suppose, our, uh, our, you know, the, the age profile of um, you know, our population is changing. So um, that in itself is going to add more stock to, yeah. the, to, to the market. So I think going forward, like we, we've gone through a, you know, a residential crisis, but I, I think we're coming out and that there, will, there is more residential on the horizon. Yeah. And look, it's not something that we want to get bogged down in yeah. today because it's not the reason why we're here. However, I think it's really important that we acknowledge uh, the concerns that employers have when they're looking at either taking on new space, extending the space that they have or investing in changing the space they have, uh, whether it's as a result of, of the pandemic or what the likely long term impacts are going to to require. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty for businesses right now. So, Joe, we know that companies, you know, there, there is uncertainty around what needs to be done in terms of compliance purely because there's uncertainty about the shape this virus is going to take long term and what the long term impacts are going to be. So, you know, Iconic Offices as a flex space provider, how can you step in to, to I suppose, really give some clarity to small businesses and to SMEs and for the FDI sector right now? I suppose the main thing is flexibility. So, um, so I suppose right now it's very difficult for companies to know well, what is my actual long-term office requirement. You know, do we account for two-meter social distancing? Will it go to one? Will it go to three? Mm. Uh, and right now in the city, if you want to take a lease on a building, you're typically looking at a minimum of 10 years with no break options. So I think the one thing that flexible workspace provides is the flexibility to come in for one year, two year, whatever you need 
to just understand what's going on to be able to make a better long term term i suppose real estate real estate strategy decision mm-hmm. um on top of that then i think um if you go to a high quality flexible workspace provider uh, you'll also find a lot of your issues solved for you um as they'll have implemented a lot of um the covid prevention strategies within the building um and that's something that all companies then will benefit benefit from and also save money on okay just because you've touched on there in terms of uh term the 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 length of um leases one of the trends we've seen from the u.s is that over the the past three to four years long-term leases the term is getting shorter because that's what the market wants but significantly and perhaps more surprisingly for short-term leases the length of time is getting longer so um, when when businesses were traditionally looking at more flexible workspace or particularly for co-working spaces mm. they were looking at much shorter term leases and the trend is now that they're actually getting longer yeah i know that that is true but ultimately the client can decide what's right for them so if they want it for six months 12 months 24 months 36 months typically an operator will be able to cater to that uh, but definitely we have seen uh, even since we've been in business the term mm. that people are looking for themselves is naturally increasing for sure okay that's an interesting one and i you know you have a built-in solution for any of the companies that are operating within iconic offices so those businesses don't have to think about the financial outlay but jerry one of the things as a consultant you for your team how are you finding um costing projects like this is it cost prohibitive for any businesses to make their premises compliant no no i think um i suppose to give you an idea um on the, the projects we've worked on for offices up to say approximately five thousand square feet, which should be a lot of a lot of the the, the smaller Dublin office uh, um, sort of marketplace. Um, we're looking at figures around two to three euro per square foot to introduce the standard suite of measures, let's call them, such as the screens and the hand sanitization. Two to signs, three euros two per to square three foot. Two to three euro per square foot. Yeah. Um, then when you get up to the larger formats and you go sort of up to 10,000, approaching 20,000, that might move closer four to five because there's other issues there that, that are introduced. Um, for example, air conditioning systems on the larger, larger office spaces, you need to look at perhaps making modifications to them, introducing uh, UV filters. Um, and probably as Joe said, as he's done here, you're introducing the, uh, or sorry, increasing the, the rate of airflow that typically because Michael's point earlier about your standard kind of design for office space is uh, one person per 10 square meters. That's your, your kind of occupancy ratio at the design stage. Similarly, in terms of uh, ventilation and fresh air, it's 10 liters per second per person. So you may look to, on, on the larger f- footprints where perhaps you have a fully um, um, mechanically ventilated building, for example, you may look to improve that and increase the uh, amount of, uh, of fresh air, uh, increase your air quality in into the building. So there are obviously costs associated with that. And again, similarly on the larger buildings, you may have issues around the vertical circulation because you may be over uh, multiple floors. So uh, the costs vary, but typically it's said on the smaller properties up to 5,000 square feet or so, it's around two to three euro square foot. And then sort of between that and, 10 to 15, 20,000, it can probably go up to four to five per square foot. Um, it really depends on, on what it is you want to do. But I suppose in a nutshell, it's not cost prohibitive. The, the, the figures aren't huge. So it's doable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and again, it's just a matter of planning it and, and coming up with uh, what the client wants. Really, yeah. Yeah, okay. if, you, if you compare it to a rates bill or a service charge bill in a building, it's like typically we pay in five, six yeah. euros a square foot in rates exactly. or five or six euros in a service charge. So it's yeah. actually proportional to that it's, yeah. it's it's not a lot of money okay and obviously in terms of value it's there but if we're looking at the larger jobs and we're talking about say people who are just embarking on an office fit out now you know you referred to there may be some hvac uh, mm. systems um in terms of your ventilation your air conditioning things like that upgrades do you think that for office fit outs now do um, do occupants need to be implementing changes on a more permanent basis as a result of the pandemic? 
it's a difficult one to call because I suppose it's still, we still don't know, like we're crystal ball gazing. We don't know ultimately what's going to happen. Um, again, if you look at the, the, the kind of the, the, the metrics around ventilation, for example, as I said, it's, it's 10 litres per second per person in an office environment. In a hospital environment, for example, that could be 60 to 80 litres per second mm-hmm. per person. So it's a huge amount of airflow. And obviously with that, it considerably larger uh, plants and equipment to, to deliver that, that air quality. So it's hard to know because you, you, we don't know how long this is going to, to, to last. Um, the 10 litres per second, going back to that, is kind of ubiquitous. It's been that's the CIBSE or uh, uh, sort of uh, standard for many, many years, for many decades, in fact. Um, and I suppose if, if, if the plan changes in terms of cellularization versus the open plan, you're probably still ultimately delivering the same airflow, albeit in a cellular environment, you're probably going to have less people per square meter within that office space as opposed to the open plan where, of course, typically you can have a lot more, a lot more desks okay. pre-COVID. And um, I, as you rightly point out, it's still too early to say how, um, in terms of a long-term plan, what structural yeah, changes are going yeah. to be required. But I suppose if we take it back, you know, before we, we wrap up today, you know, we really want to make this as actionable for people listening in, because as we mentioned at the top, you know, 20, 29% of employers don't have a plan to bring their employees back yet. So, you know, let's break that down into the most important first step. So, Joe, you've gone through, you know, the, the response plan and the points that were taken to get employees back. Yeah. But can you tell us what were the biggest pain points when you were implementing those? Um we put so much time into it because we had to do it on behalf of so many companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the research was probably to, to, to get through all the information and pick out the things that were really critical and actionable that made sense. That was uh, difficult. Um, yeah, I, I think f- for companies, like they need a plan um, and they need to communicate. And um, during the pandemic, uh, like that was kind of one of our number one things. And a lot of the time we didn't actually have much to say Mm -hmm. but uh we still decided that we were going to continue to communicate to people and i think for those companies that don't have a plan there's a good chance they're not communicating either and i think that's kind of a dangerous place to be so i think you need to get a plan together even if it doesn't have all the detail and then you need to be communicating it so that people feel more at ease okay that's an interesting one in terms of communication so you know are you referring primarily to internal communications for your own team or or more to to well, your client base yeah well for, for other companies it'll be obviously to their teams but for us at the outset we consciously made the decision that while we weren't going to have all the answers straight away communication was really really important and that worked for both staff and members also okay being a relatively young company as in within the past decade yes um you have the the advantage of agility you know and maybe larger ships uh, and longer established ships on the course are much harder to turn um, and that's one thing we see routinely so the ability to change in response to latest public health announcements that's been really fundamental so I suppose Michael you might just talk to us about the Savills experience there because again we talked about how uh, you were able to bring in the expertise from your international colleagues and that's great but in terms of being able to respond to the latest press briefing and they were they were obviously happening every 24 hours was how difficult is it to remain responsive well i think everyone has to accept uh, both at management level and employee level that you know that the plan has to be flexible mm-hmm. and it could change at a, at a moment's notice so um like savile's invested heavily in our it over the last um, you know re- relatively recent period over the last three years Mm-hmm. Um, so when the lockdown happened, we were we were really well set up to to all work remotely, and we're all being told that you know make sure you bring your laptop home every evening just in case there's a there's a, another lockdown. So I think yeah, interesting about the twenty nine percent of um, uh, work or companies not having a plan about going back. I think everyone needs to you know get a plan, um, and I suppose it needs to be adaptable. Like it could change at a, at a moment's notice, and that's okay. Uh, this is a this is a, a moving um, uh, feast. So I think yeah, get a plan and um, stick to it as you can. But it just needs to be adaptable. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And a question has actually come in from you there. In a Dublin context, where do office occupiers ideally want to locate? So, you know, we, we've spoken today about the preference for people. 93% of employees want to remote work at least some of the time. And so that brings us back to the hub and spoke yeah. offering that, that we've been advocating um, over the past number of years. Is there still a preference for Dublin City Centre? Yeah, so like um, Dublin City Centre has been the kind of location of choice for the, the majority of companies, followed by perhaps, you know, South Dublin, um, you know, because it's linked to the city centre by the, the Lewis line. Um, um, but I, I think when you look at Dublin, uh, all the public transport um, road networks and everything kind of run into the city centre and there are very few orbital routes. And for that, that's the main reason that uh, the city centre is so popular because it's the one place you can put an office and you can be sure that you're, you're going to be appealed to the broadest talent pool across the city. Um, but yeah, there, there is now, um, so we're talking about remote working before the lockdown and we're especially talking about it now. And I, I, there is an appetite for some employees, some corporates to, to work close to home and cut out the commute. So there, there, there are organizations looking at adopting the, the hub and spoke model. So they continue to have their base in the city center, um, but have a, or a hub in the city center and have the spoke out in the periphery of Dublin. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for, for a flexible office provider to, to come in and um, offer uh, corporates in the city center the, the choice of say having 20 people working from NACE, for instance, mm -hmm. Uh, and having to avoid that commute into the, the city centre. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, that's, we don't want to go down the, the route of trying to predict the future, but in terms of getting the plan in place, you know, that's the most tangible yes. information that we have at the moment, and it's, it's a really important one. Um, and I suppose, really, in terms of the pain points, and I know we've touched on a number of them here today, um, Jerry, as a consultant, you're working perhaps with a wider range of businesses. Are you seeing that vary from sector to sector, the pain points of implementing these new measures? Yes, to, I suppose to a point, yes. Um, I know, I, I suppose going back to what Michael was saying there about um, um, the working from home, the hub and spoke concept. Um, just on that, I suppose that there's been a bit of a debate uh, with employers as well about that in terms of, Maybe they want to get a certain proportion, certain numbers of the workforce back, um, but an acceptance that perhaps not all will come back or not, not all need to come back, um, allowing for greater flexibility as well um, for those who, who may want to come in periodically into the office or just need to come in in offices. And then I suppose there's a wider and a broader kind of social uh, view on that, but certainly with some of the larger employers, because they're looking at, I suppose, that perhaps there are positives to this as well, particularly for for employees that may live in a suburban um, uh, context relative to their workplace, mm -hmm. be that Dublin, Limerick, Cork, Galway, Waterford, wherever it might be, and that there's an opportunity perhaps to, I suppose, share an economic benefit of people not having to all travel into the city centre in whatever given city centre that might be, um, and obviously the associated issues that in terms of uh, traffic congestion and so on, but there's also the economic uh, dividend of if, for example, Jerry is living in suburban Dublin and he's able to work from home two or three days a week, there's probably a bit more of a, of, of a spend in that local um, town or village or whatever it might be, as opposed to previously it was all kind of, you know, uh, spent in the city centre. So there's that kind of, um, I suppose, um, uh, an offset uh, in that environment, as well, which is a benefit. Um, and I think so, so employers, once you talk about the, the, I suppose the pain points, they're also looking, I suppose, mm. the, 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 the positive aspects of it. So it, it, really, it really is a balancing act, um, and it's down to what individual employers want. I think, going back to your point on the 29% who have no plan in place yet, I suspect some of those may be uh, very large companies who, again, using your, 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 your large ship uh, analogy, again, it's, 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 it's a large plan for them to try and implement change um, across uh, their entire workforce perhaps so they're probably practically looking at it in terms of we've invested to get our people working from home it's working fine uh, we're happy with productivity um, we may choose to just wait a little bit longer until there's more definition in terms of what's going to happen particularly between now and the run into Christmas because 
I know certainly, well, anecdotally, some of the larger companies um, have said to their uh, employees that we're probably not going to move you back in prior to Christmas, or if we do, it'll be quite close to Christmas. Um, so I think there's, there's that as well. They're looking at, you know, the costs associated, obviously for costs associated to get them people to work from home, mm-hmm. and there's a cost to get them back, uh, which could be substantial. So they're probably um, just biding their time for now, which is understandable. But having said that, and I'd echo what Michael said, I think it is important, even at that, even if you're looking to not possibly return for three to six months, I still think you need to be looking at a plan, just have a basic plan, just to, just to, to challenge the, the, the business model you have at the moment to see what you need to do to move forward. Okay. And I think as well, if, if, if employers are, continue, are considering allowing or facilitating their staff working from home for the foreseeable future, um, you know, the, the whole debate about their occupational health needs come into play. Into play. So, you know, um, I remember, you know, three weeks into lockdown, I could hardly walk because I was sat on the dining room uh, chair for, for, for th- you know, for that period of time. Um, so I think if, if, if companies are considering, you know, adopting more remote working, they need to set up their employees better, um, 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 you know, with desks, d- dual screens, with proper seating. And then the whole debate comes into, you know, who pays for their rent? You know, some people are living in shared accommodation. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people, like myself, have young kids at home. Um, you know, how, how, how is all that managed? So I think these are the things that, uh, you know, that, that employers should think about when devising a strategy for coming back to the open up the office again yeah i i think that that's such an important element kind of the human yeah. element because again a lot of our conversation today has centered on the workplace mm. you know and 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 as was our intention but the reality is the workplace is only there to provide for a happy workforce and if the workforce can be kept happy in, and well and safe in other ways you know it, it feels like the conversation around well buildings really only started over the past decade and it's probably very early to say what the impact of the pandemic is likely to have yes. on that. But we do know that any plan to move forward, whether it's with a hybrid of remote or, or office or in office working, you know, it needs to be a people first approach. And we probably don't know what the human element is going to be here in terms of people's perception mm. coming back to the office and um, how people are going to feel safe working it's very early to say how that's going to yeah. change. I mean, do we, do we know how the culture, Joe, you, through iconic offices, you know, you're not just responsible for the culture of your, your own organization, but you're, you're really steering and helping to shape the culture of so many other organizations under, uh, under the roof of your 16 buildings. Yeah. How, do we know how this is likely to impact? Yeah. Well, I suppose for us, we would have done a lot of kind of events, um, I suppose, network within the physical buildings at the time uh, to bring the communities together. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, we had to react really quickly and uh, adjust the business model to get the events online. Um, So we set up a virtual events program where we were delivering yoga, Pilates, lunch and learns, talks uh, into people's homes. Um, So, yeah, it's no doubt that companies need to adjust and need to account for um, making sure that their employees aren't isolated in their home. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think we've all heard stories of how that can uh, affect people's mental health. So it's really important that employers keep an eye on their company culture mm-hmm. and still find ways virtually to bring their teams together. Yeah, I, I, the product, I, I think the wellness issue and the productivity issue, they dovetail nicely mm-hmm. because in the first month or two of lockdown, businesses were very surprised to see the productivity levels were maintained and in Mm. some cases exceeded i wasn't surprised by that at all because as somebody who operates and runs a remote team our graphic designers in canada our web developer is in north kerry you know so we despite having an office in city west we we have been operating remotely um, and managing remote teams for a long period of time however one of the things that i'm very aware of is that when you're working from home there is a tendency that an eight-hour day work turns into a 10-hour day, but but it's a very real 10-hour day. Mm. You don't have time off while you're commuting from one meeting to another. You don't have downtime when when you arrive 15 minutes early for the meeting and you have coffee and you get to check your emails. There's no downtime when you're working from home. And that's one of the considerations, I think, that makes working from home um, 
yes, productive, but I'm not sure about in terms of health benefits. There needs to be a discipline. We need to learn if we're going to work from home. Sometimes we need to learn how to do that safely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Is that something that employers have a responsibility towards? Because we talk about employers wanting to maintain productivity through a remote team. How responsible are they for maintaining a good life work balance and maintaining the health of staff that are working from home? I think I, from our experience on the, on, the, on the work we've done with, with, with various employers, I think they're, they're acutely aware of it. They're very concerned about it because ultimately the, your workforce is your business. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, 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 that's what we're, we're dealing with. That's what it's all about, I suppose. And they, 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 are, they are concerned both for clearly the, the, the employee, the workforce at home, how they're managing at home, and then the process of getting them back into the workplace. There's no question about that. Um, and in, in the studies we've done and the surveys we've done, it's, it's part and parcel of, of that whole plan, as I mentioned earlier, with, with that early engagement. So you're, you're almost, you're plotting the step-by-step mm-hmm. with engagement, um, uh, fully, full engagement with the employees as to what it is you're hoping to do. And you're taking soundings back from them. Um, in terms of their concerns or, or, or their approval of, of, of the plans they're putting in place. But it is certainly a concern. There's no, there's no question that I think all the employ, employers that we've spoken to, it's, it's, it's paramount, absolutely. I think it is a concern. I think the reality is for a lot of employers, especially the more indigenous ones, they just don't have the tools. They just don't have the experience. This was something for a lot of people that just mm. was landed upon them. Mm. And, you know, they're raffling around trying to find solutions and they don't have the training yeah. themselves or the experience themselves of having worked remotely for a company um, themselves. So um, it's difficult. You, know, you made a great point earlier that this is where leadership comes in mm. and leadership means taking charge in situations that might be uncertain, even if that means risking making mistakes. Yeah, I think what I mean, we touched on, you know, the first step of, you know, coming up with the plan about going back to work is to survey um, everyone and get their opinion. But at the same time, you know, a a leader needs to take into account uh, everyone's opinion and make a decision, Mm -hmm. not get the survey results back and not make a decision because, Mm -hmm. you know, not everyone was happy about this, that and the other. So I think that's where leadership comes into play. And those 29% of um, uh, companies that haven't come up with a plan yet, um, I think, yeah, they, they need to have be decisive leaders and just get on with it. Okay. Actually, I think there are great final words to finish on, decisive <laughs> leadership and just get on with it. Um, my thanks again to Jerry Corcoran of BNP Paribas Real Estate, Joe McGinley, Iconic Offices, and thank you for hosting us no in problem. this fabulous building today, and Michael Healy of Savills, Ireland. Thank you for being with us and thank you for joining us remotely uh, for the first in a series of Iconic Offices webinars where we navigate the COVID-19 landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you, Joe. Gentlemen, thank you so much.